Hello, writers and crafters. I'm Valerie Isan. And I'm Eric Mertz. And this is episode 74 of the podcast, and it's June 29th, 2022, as we record this. Our main topic today is how to catch up when everything is falling down around you and you're so far behind and you're drowning and blah, blah, blah. How do you catch up? That is our topic today. We don't have any new patrons today, but thank you so much for the ongoing patronage from our patrons. And for as low as a dollar a month, you can get a shout out on the podcast. We can make announcements for you and at other tiers, the benefits increase. There's lots of nifty, cool stuff there. Go check out patreon.com slash Valerie Isan, I-H-S-A-N. You know, that's such as an odd spelling. Um, I mean, it's not English, it's not American, no. so. <laughs> but it's, I, I don't see that it's that difficult, but the, the typo that happens very frequently for that name is um, the S and the H get swapped. I was going to say, it's probably an autocorrect thing, right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Sean Every five is not a word either. So. <laughs> right, right. Every five letter word that I see now just is a wordle word. And I, I mean, the, you <laughs> said it at one point, I'm like, I, can I put that in? <laughs> got two vowels i would get the s and the h not in order but anyway Ali plays wordle. wordle and he also plays quirtle is that how you say it it's yeah. another it's another one that you play it's like four games that you're playing at the same time and and my brother-in-law does that he's like he'll we have this little text group where everybody posts their wordle when they get it and it becomes kind of a competition they're on the east coast so of course they're going to get theirs first if they do uh -huh. it in the morning but everyone so he does it like twice a week you know the whole group will be all happy and celebrating their wordles and then you'll get this quirtle block of like four of them and it's a little bit of a like you know <laughs> i'm the king of words for a while he was on a on a on a um you call it um he was doing it every streak. day a streak oh, yeah. yeah and he'd, he'd be like ah, oh, i missed my streak damn it <laughs> Here's the tragedy of a new phone. I got a new phone like six weeks ago. And it, it, when I changed everything over, it lost my streak of Wordle, which was at like 48. Mm. And it, when I did it again, it said the streak was one. And I was, you know. Was How is devastated. that even possible? Oh, I guess because the app records it. But the app should yeah. go over. It like if you download well, Spotify app on your new phone, it's going to have all of your playlists and stuff. Right. And like 60%. Well, Wordle isn't an app. It's just on, I just play it on the, the website. So it, that's yeah. Weird. That it's doesn't a, even make it, sense. The whole tragedy of <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, none of it made sense because they said everything will transfer over, like 60% of the things transferred over. Like, I was then re-entering passwords and doing weird stuff. Anyway, iPhone, okay. shake my fist. What are you reading? <laughs> I just finished last night in bed, Project Hail Mary. Totally worth it. I definitely recommend that book. Interesting. Why don't you ask me what I'm reading? What are you reading? <laughs> I just started Project Hail Mary two days ago. <laughs> On your enthusiasm after the last podcast, I, I couldn't. I couldn't turn it down. So. Couldn't turn it down. It's pretty great. I really liked it. And I'm not a sci-fi reader, so. It's sciencey, uh, but it is good. Yeah. How far, what's happening? How far into it are you? Uh, well, he just he figured out his name. Okay. Name the name. Um, starting to figure out like where, uh, like the, he just got to the place where the Chinese, like there's, like he figured out that there's the, the Russians and the Chinese, like who's all involved in what, what he's doing. He's like mm -hmm. piecing, still piecing things together. I'm like on page 670 or something. It was a little hard in the first That's not chapter. 670, by the way, dear listener. <laughs> no, no, it's 60 or 70. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Haven't had enough tea yet. Um, yeah, so it was a little, the first chapter was a challenge. It had that sort of like, you know, oh my God, what am I? What am I? And who am I? And couldn't that was a little hard to read, but oh, really? I liked that kind of stuff. I like being thrown in the middle and, and learning things with the characters. I like that too. I like the device where he was guessing names and saying it, and the computer kept rejecting it because it wasn't <laughs> the right name. I that was that was my hook right there. Like, I thought this is clever, I love it. And yeah, so yeah, thanks for the recommendation. I think you'll like it. 
I, so so no I, longer jail blazers that was finished finished that book i mean i ate that up man i just ate it up i love my basketball but it's sometimes a little guilty when you're you know it just looks a little tabloid when you're reading it you know so i have to be a little i have to be a little self-conscious about what i read i'm a serious person <laughs> so i have not yet started actually that's not true i am also reading that craft in the real world book for a book right. club but i'm not really into it it's pretty academic and i don't jive with that academic lingo so much so so um, quick and quick and dirty definition on your part difference between like a craft book that's accessible and a craft book that is like academic like do you do you have like a do you have a certain element in the book that you draw the line where you say this is too academic or is it just a just feel? The, it's just the language i think that the, right. that the author is trained is using and yeah I guess it's just the language that's what makes it accessible to me or not and that's Got true it. of any book any novel any nonfiction book any you know because i first am interested in a book based on the topic right um and so i or the you know the book jacket and then i open it up and like read a couple paragraphs or a couple sentences here and there through um you know maybe the first page but usually like in the middle or i open it to a couple different random places and just read a few sentences and see if it's like lingo or prose that I can sink into and, and absorb. And if it's kind of not, I didn't want to use the word clunky because that would imply that it's bad writing, but it's not right. that it's bad writing. It's that it's not a writing style that I enjoy reading. It's not flu. Got it. That makes sense. I Interesting want... that you br bring up the, the reading around. I always investigate a book. You know, I read the I read everything. And when I picked up uh, Project Hail Mary, the inside, I have the, the hardback of it. Thank you to, thank you. Shout out to my mom who gets those from the library bookstore. Uh -huh. um, in the inside, it, it had the character's name like on the inside. I thought, oh, okay. Well, the mystery of who, who this person is, like it's, it says Ryland Grace. Oh, spoiler to anybody that might read it. <laughs> the doctor, you know. But I thought like, oh my gosh, like this investigating the book bit me here. It, it, ne it almost never does, but it felt a little weird to, to know the name of the, uh, before the guy did in the book, I wanted to learn with him. But, so you investigate a book, you look at it, you, you kind of yeah. check it out. Yeah. I do that too. Usually. Um, so when I go to Powell's, I get a basket Sensory and I spend a couple time. of, yeah, I have to spend a couple hours there. If it's only an hour, then I'm like, I can still do it, but it's a, it's an aborted mission, you know? So right. I, I'm going through and I'm just kind of loading up the basket with stuff that looks interesting via um, the book jacket, really, and yeah. the title and the topic and, and throwing them all in. And then I go to the mark to the cafe downstairs or upstairs, or I forget where it is actually. Upstairs. So I go to that cafe and I get a coffee and I sit down and I start um, doing that more investigative, yeah. you know, That's work. Familiar. And then whittle it down because usually there's hundreds of dollars worth of books in the basket and I try to whittle it down to like 80 or something right so that's <laughs> the question hard. do you go into pals with a list or a budget um oh they're so, they're so li each are so limiting right you don't want either one I was gonna say neither but <laughs> <laughs> you're chaotic it's more of a feel I, I am yeah that's oh, good so in terms of next books up you know I don't know. This is the stack as of the morning, you know, of, of June 29th. So this may change by tomorrow, but um, I have an arc for the book woman's daughter by Kim Michelle Richardson. I don't know if you can nope, see this because I can't up. see my, I can't even see my, my camera is covered. covered. Um, Another so printed wrote, arc. Well, I got to get in on this bookstore thing. <laughs> the Book Woman of Troublesome Creek is the first one. And I really loved that. That was a historical fiction, 1930s, Kentucky, Appalachian. Um, it was based on the Pack Horse Library route hmm. back in the days when, when um, these librarians would ride their horses with their bag of books to all the rural poor folk that couldn't get in to libraries or whatever books and and would loan out books and they would have a route and and she was the um 
one of the last remaining blues of Kentucky. So this was a colored person um, that had a blue tinge to her, her skin. And so there's, there's you know, themes of racism and poverty and prejudice. And, you know, that sort of is kind of in the, the thematic um, of the book, but it was just riveting. I just really, really loved it. And it's based on actual, you know, people, it's a medical condition. So um, yeah, it was super fabulous. So this is the second book in that um, series, I guess it's the sequel. So that one, or I don't read short stories, but my coworker reads them a lot. You write them. I know lots of writers that write them. And so I thought I would try a book of short stories. This one's called Magic for Beginners. Interesting. By What's Kelly the, are they, what, what genre are we in? Um, it looks like kind of magical realism, sort of. Um, Very cool. I'm not sure though, because there's just a tiny little blurb. <laughs> Exquisite dreamlike dispatch from the virtuoso storyteller who can do seemingly anything. Reconstructs a... modern life through an intoxicating prism, conjuring up unforgettable worlds with humor and humanity. So I fantasy, maybe, I don't know. That, that sounds, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds nice. I like that sort of like that Gabriel Garcia Marquez, like magical realism feel is, yeah, got that. 100 Years of Solitude is Ali's favorite book or one of his I favorite think he, books. I think he told me that when, when we had drinks a few years ago at, at, mm -hmm. after the tsunami books thing. Yeah. That's a, it's got like a great first line, that first line about the last thing that the person thought at the firing squad was of ice, which is that like, that first line just sets the whole tone of the of that book. Maybe may a reread. All right, let's get into our main topic. Let's do it. What do you do when, when everything's falling apart around you? I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> Actually, what I was going <laughs> to was... ask you, I was going to ask you if you've ever been behind. Have you ever fallen behind on your work, Eric? I fall behind oh, all yeah. the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the all the time all the time it's kind of um, my mo these days <laughs> really <laughs> and yeah i think it's because i have the entrepreneurial spirit of a full-time writer and i only have two days a week to do that on so i'm constantly trying to shove full-time work into two days and I have to constantly remind myself that that's just not physically possible okay. <laughs> so i have to back off and uh, readjust my expectations of myself and, right. and what I can be doing. There is so, step number one, yeah. readjust expectations. Which just always, I feel so lame about that. Like, I don't want to lower my expectations. I want to reach for the stars, you know, and then if I fall right. a little bit, I'm still above average. I don't want right. to lower my expectations. Right. That just sounds so pedestrian. I don't know. That's a very know. visceral feeling for me that like, the disappointment of having to change expectations professionally, creatively, that I can, I can feel it. I know what that feels like in my mm -hmm. body. Um, it's when you were saying that, like, I just, I had a little glimmer of it. Mm -hmm. um, my method there, I don't know if like, you know, if we want to talk about methodology, of course. I, I, and this partly comes, you know, I've, I've sort of, I am a sports person. I love sports. Like you're going to lose games. You're going to lose you know, I played sports in high school, like losses are just part of it. And I just feel like you have to take, sometimes just take that loss, feel the loss, mm -hmm. experience it. Don't be one of those proud people that, that can't lose. Cause anytime I've had the feeling of like, well, I can't lose right now. I have to push. It just, you're going to dig a deeper hole. And that's the first thing you do when you find yourself in a hole is you stop digging and you know, you got to regroup. So just take the loss, right? That's, I had this experience, like my first my first year without working a, a desk job it was nine years ago. And it was probably around this time of the year, right? It was, it was in June or July. I just remember like having to walk out of my office, go upstairs, sit outside and just accept it. Cause I'd been fighting it for so long. I just had to go up mm -hmm. there and just take the, take the, the hit and then mm -hmm. let it go. Just, yeah. And then just regroup. That's yeah. the other part. You got to regroup. Make a new plan, Stan. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I think it helps to, I think the emotional feeling, the emotional hit of losing helps you prepare for it. Cause it's always going to happen. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good your plan is. It's, it's you're going to find yourself back in a hole again. You nobody can prepare for everything. I often daydream, you know, about the person who's just got like a patron and that's funding their life and they have every profession, you know, they can hire out the best, like there's that person out there, but we're not them. So you're going to take another hit. You're going to lose track of time. Something you're going to get sick. You're going to have to tend to something you don't want to, and it's going to put you behind. You just have to accept it. I read this book um, years ago that was really mind blowing for me. And it's called, I put the the link in the show notes. It's called how, um, actually, did I write it down? Here it is. Productivity for creative people, how to get creative work done in an always on world by Mark McGinnis. So I put the link in the show notes and basically it's a short book, but what what I pulled out of it is there are, there are four things that we as creative slash business people work on. One is asset building. So if you're building a website or you're writing a book or content marketing, you know, that's all asset building because it's part of your IP really. Right. Um, the second would be your, your weekly work, the stuff that you just have to do to keep your business running, paying bills and answering emails and podcasting. (laughs) Well, I guess this is content marketing, but you know, just the, just the things that you have to have to do every week or day, depending on how your hours work. Um, the third is like special event, something that you're like, you're speaking at a conference or you're planning a literary event, or, you know, it's something that's out of the norm, Mm -hmm. a book release. Yeah. Something that's out of the norm, but it takes up a lot of hours of preparation. And then the last thing is backlog. And so that's the catching up of stuff. So for instance, if you are, if you are doing your special event planning, then the time that you would spend on that, you can't also, there's things that are going to be left undone. So there'll be a time when you have to go back and, and catch up with, with, with right. that stuff. And I had never looked at it as a separate task. It just became like this never ending to-do list that never got done and I never got to cross it off. And I just felt like continual failure every day. Right. I know that. So, yeah, I hear you. So looking at it like, oh, so, and I can only do two things at a time out of those four. So you can do your weekly work and you can build an asset or you can do your weekly work and plan a special event, or you can do your weekly work in your backlog. I love that you're always adding weekly work in there. Well, you know, otherwise it becomes backlog. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I was just going to say, you can really keep that to keep that backlog pared down. You got to do the weekly work. Right. And eventually, you know, as you build your, your empire, your writing empire, you're going to have VAs and assistants, you know, theoretically that will take up some of that weekly work. So then maybe you can do your asset building and plan a special event and you won't have the backlog to deal with because somebody else is doing the weekly work. So those are, but one person kind of can really just juggle two at a time. Right. And that to me was, I don't know, it was just so mind blowing. It was such a different yeah. way of looking at all of the things and how to manage them. And maybe it was just different labeled buckets that worked for me. Yeah. I don't know, but it was just yeah. like a mind blowing book for me. So hopefully that resource will be helpful to some of our listeners. You know, and after I had that, first initial, I don't want to call it a breakdown because I didn't really break down, but like I had that, like I described earlier, I just had to walk away and, and take the loss. I developed a theory for myself because um, what was really bogging me at that period was my, I started out on a freelance, you know, independent person, writer, and like my website was just woefully behind. I should have done that first. I should have done that before I left, but then I was spending, I was, I was 
taking in new clients. I was doing client work and I was also trying to like rebuild a website. And, and that was just, so after that, I developed this theory that there's three buckets in your professional world. There's the things that you do well, you know how to do. And these are the things that you're always going to do, right? That's for me, that's the writing. That's the client conversations. Uh, that's the, the creating of my own stories. Like those, I will always be able to do those things. I'm never going to hire somebody to write my book for me. I'm never going to hire somebody to take my phone calls for me or client service for me. I can, those are things I'm always going to do. There's this other column on the opposite side that are, these are the things I can't do. These are things mm -hmm. like I don't have the skills. They're too time consuming. They're not even, they would cost too much of my time to learn how to do them to be worthwhile. So I have that bucket. And for me, look, I could probably do my website stuff, um, like the back end technical things. I just have somebody that does it like every six months. They go in, they clean things up. They, I pay them. They do that. At, that's it's the time that I the time that I am not frustrated over trying to figure out WordPress is gold. Then there's the column that I have in the middle, and these are the unexpected things that crop up that I have to decide: is it worth my time? Because I didn't know that I was going to be making graphics on Canva when I started out. I didn't know, mm -hmm. but I've figured out that I can do this. Like I, I have enough of a visual sense to make an ad to put up on, you know, to put with a blog or I can do that. So I moved that over to the column of I'm always, I'm going to do this. Um, there's other things that I've picked up, like I'm running Google ads and Facebook ads right now. I don't, I pay somebody to do that. I move that into that column. So I think one of the ways that you keep the backlog from growing and keep those tasks moving is just, you have to have some real clear boundaries and values on what, this is what I do. This is what I don't do. And a, a clear eye for the things in the middle and be decisive. Like if you, if you're on your business and you know, I am spending way too much time for this, you just move it into that column, get rid of it. Cause mm -hmm. that extra time that you're getting, doing the things that you get paid for, it's, you know, you gotta be, you have to be decisive about that. You can't learn how to do everything or you're, or maybe, maybe you can't, but I, that's not, I think most people. I was listening to a podcast last week, um, author like a boss with Ella Bar Barnard. I never say her last name right, but she was interviewing Willow. Oh my God. I'm forgetting all the Willow Winters. Who's this like That's a great name. Willow Winters. She's a, a romance author and she, I, I was going to really say probably a romance an empire. Author. She's got a publishing company and a nonprofit and she's got co-authors wow. and like 50 books. And, you know, so she really has an empire. And she said, one of the best things that she did, and she recommends this book to everybody is the book essentialism. So I went out and ordered it. <laughs> it's coming Good. today. Um, I should put that in the show notes too, but I don't remember yeah. who the authors I'll, I'll look it up and put it in the show notes. Um, but yeah, she said basically, and I haven't read it yet, but she said the book helped her, um, say no so that she could say it wasn't so that she could say yes to other things. It was more like, if you say no, Maybe you'll disappoint people in the short term, but in the long term, you're going to be attracting all of the yes stuff to you. Yeah. So yeah. then your work is more fulfilling and you, you do all those things that you said that are in your bracket, you know, all of the things right. that you're really good at and that people respect you for and look up to you and you're the expert in this and, and you can do it quickly because it's, you know, second nature to you. Right. And, and you can say no to those other things. And because right now as baby entrepreneurs, you know, <laughs> we kind of say yes to everything just to get clients or to get the experience, or we're excited about the project and we just forget right. how long it's going to actually take or <laughs> whatever. And that was, and also the conditioning. I don't know. I, I don't know yeah. about you, but as a woman, you know, you say yes and you do everything for other people and, and, and that becomes yeah. kind of a. I mean, it becomes part of you, even though you logically say, no, I don't want to be that kind of person. It's still sort of a knee jerk, you know, right. response to, I have to make everyone else happy. 
and do the things for other people. Yeah. I mean, I'm my mother's son and I, it's hard for me to say no to things. And, and one of the, I would say like the, one of the watershed moments professionally for me was that I said, no, like there was a job. It wasn't enough money for the time. And I just, I did the calculus and said, it's better for me to wait for something else than it is to say yes to this thing because, and that was really hard. And then, but it became this addictive, like it became like running, you know, like the way people Mm -hmm. describe running, like it's grueling, it's difficult, but like getting to the no felt good and it was worth the effort. I say yes, I, you know, I, there's, I have a regular client, quick anecdote, guy is great, has really fantastic screenplay ideas. Um, I really like talking to him. I really love his ideas. He just doesn't have money. He pays, you know, in the beginning, I took everything. And and so I was writing screenplays for less than I was worth. And now, you know, it's it's just hard because I've had to tell him no a couple of times. I've actually found him another screenwriter that would work for the, the money that he had, kind of more of a hobbyist. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's hard, it, you know, and I still, when, when he calls, he called actually last Friday cause he wanted to, he was really into an idea. It still breaks me up a little bit to think, oh, I'm not going to write that. I love the idea. Mm-hmm. Send them, you know, so that's, but you have to do those things. Cause if you do say yes, you are short, you are sh- to everything. You are short circuiting something else. You're, you're putting something else in the backlog. Yeah. Two things that came to mind when you said that was one, if you do feel like, and I'm, and I'm not saying you should do this with this gentleman, but in your business, if, if an entrepreneur feels the need to scholarship someone or, you know, heavily discount their services for someone, you can build that into your business philosophy. So you can say like every quarter I'm going to you know, offer a free service up to, you know, this amount of money or something like that, just so that it's built in, you're expecting it, you know, there's some feel goodness that comes with that, but also it helps writers out, you know, and, and it's, so you can still feel like you're giving back, but not, you know, at your, at your discomfort or at your, um, that you're hurting yourself and your finances by doing that. And then I already forgot the other thing I was going to say. Well, so, so that to your oh, point, I know what like it was. I, oh, go, go. <laughs> I remember one time I, um, I fired a client because it was causing Ooh. me so much stress to work with them. I just, every time I'd get an email for a new job, I would just like break into a sweat and just be oh, yeah. so, uh, I just did not want to work for this person anymore. The work was not what I signed up for. It was too hard. It was not, I wasn't getting paid enough. I didn't like the work. It was always, always rush jobs. So I had to drop everything in my life, not just work, but life to get the thing done. And I hated it so much, but it was like a major part of my income (laughs) and I had to fire her. So, and I just, like you said, I had that, I had that like, okay, if I let this go, it's just going to give me space for the kind of clients that I do want. Right. And of course they come, you know, you have to have the space in order for that stuff to come in. Right. And I have that, I had that happen recently where there was somebody who, I know I look for, I want repeat clients. I will always prioritize somebody who I feel like is going to be a repeat client. And I had a potential repeat, repeat client come through. And the first job was a rush job that came with a brow beating. And then it was another rush job that came with a brow. And I thought like, you know what? I don't need this. I don't care how, if the, if the, if the faucet will run forever, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to like always have to drop things for you. And then yeah, we could talk about abusive clients a whole nother time, but you just don't, <laughs> right. Like, and, 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 and the person in themselves doesn't have to be abusive. I guess that's more the point. Like if you are, if you're taking away from things that you need to feel good about your job, the client could be the nicest client in the world. If they're not, they're not helping you help yourself. And I think like the best clients for me are the ones I feel this like simpatico with where like, I have a couple of great clients right now where we just have an ebb and flow, like they'll know, Hey, I'm, I've got a rough week. The kid's not in camp. I'm taking a little more time for myself. It's going to take me longer. And they say, great, let me know. Mm -hmm. You have to have that. You, you, you do, because ideally if you're in the writer services business, you're an entrepreneur working for other entrepreneurs and you have that, you have a mutual understanding uh, of what it takes to keep the thing, you know, to keep 
doing what you're doing. And to your first point, yeah, I always have a, I, I've got a couple of clients that I, that fit that. I got a guy that I do to do things for because he's on a budget and I just like him. And this is the thing I, you know, he's the guy that I'm helping. Mm-hmm. And it feels good. You have to have something like that. that yeah. you're not always, not everybody's like a cash register you can treat people like that. That's true. And That's in, in, in reference to the other thing you were talking about, the, um, I think that falls under the boundaries category, you know? So yeah. if, if you, you just have to stick with your own boundaries and, and spend some time figuring out what those are. Oh yeah. And, and like, where's your bottom line and where do you actually want to operate under and then how low will you go? <laughs> right. And then, yeah. And then just start cutting people off because you yeah, have, and to have an idea, of, have an idea of what your business is about and make sure the things you're doing fit your values. And some of those values are profit, have dynamic values, right? Like some of your values are, I need to survive and other values are, I want to work for cool people. And you have to just find the, the blend of that. And if you're maximizing your time and energy you can you can accomplish that it's just it takes practice it's not you're not going to get it the first shot through that's true it takes okay time. so how to catch up when you've fallen behind um stop in a digging nutshell. when you're in the hole stop yeah. digging stop <laughs> just accept the loss and stop and and also treat backlog as your job you know like if you have fallen sp- so far behind, you know, you can just make that be your next project is just to catch up. I mean, sometimes that happens naturally when you come back from vacation or something like that. And you just spend the day, like reading all your emails and like responding to stuff that happened while you were gone. Um, and I think having, having a morning routine or, or some sort of routine that gets you into your flow state is good to like, power you through. If I've got too much on my plate, sometimes I have to just completely let go, put the blinders up and just start walking, you know, one foot in front of the other, what's right in front of me. Let's just do this. Let's just do this and, and just start digging, you know, (laughs) until it's done and then make a plan to not do that again, you know, or double my estimation on how long things take. And those are all, all, all tools that I use, reset my strategies. Also, yeah, don't have, don't have a plan that's so rigid that you, it can't, like the first thing that tests it makes it fall apart. You have, part of your plan has to be flexibility and it has yeah. to be, it has to be responsive. You know, it just, it can't be all strength. You got to be flexible too. Yeah, absolutely. A parting thought I heard on a podcast yesterday, um, cool. diary of a CEO, I think was the one I was listening to. Um, there was a quote that just sort of like blew me out of the water. And it said, our job is not to be the best, which is mind blowing all in right. of itself. Just, Cause you know, I kind of feel went, like that is, <laughs> right. so our job is not to be the best. It's to do your best. Oh boy. So I'm going to say that three times today. <laughs> <laughs> that felt really good because you can yeah. only do what you can do. And sometimes your best is different every day. So if you just show up and do your best, then then you're, you're doing your job. That's golden advice. The world does not give very often. (laughs) I love it. Thank you for that. And a similar one, actually, that I use frequently, if we're talking mantras, as we end the conversation is um, Tex Thompson. Do you remember? She comes and talks at, uh, she's awesome. This writer from Texas. She always wears the red shirt and the red hat and she has a great newsletter. So if you want to, Oh, I was just going to say the best newsletter. Ever. ever like all the locksmithing stuff <laughs> and the the she's great yeah yeah so one of her newsletters a couple of years ago and I still use this she was just talking about you know sometimes all you can do is hold the line you know when you're yeah. talking like military or something like that where yeah. you're just holding the line and just not letting anything get past and sometimes you can't advance you just don't have it in yeah. you for whatever reason so if you can just hold the line some days that's all there is and i took such comfort in that and you know it's oh, almost become it. the mantra so when i'm having a really bad day i'm like my weekly win is i've held the line like <laughs> right right and i am proud of that <laughs> that's a great mantra and it's a good one to end on yes Thanks for talking with me, Eric. This was a really comforting conversation, actually. Great, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) So our next episode is 
either a coaching session with Eric, <laughs> as you like, <laughs> I don't want to do that online. I do. I do. I just want to be like, well, yeah, we should have a conversation before we do that. I don't, like I said, I want to, I might like lay on a couch, like we're in a, th- in a therapist's office or something for that one. Or we can talk about marketing. Ooh, let's, let's dissect me. Like let's put marketing, marketing is so like, I feel like if the longer we put off marketing, the more we'll know about it. So we might as well just put it off forever. <laughs> is that bad? Uh, no, not at all. I would love okay. to, to uh, start a coaching session with you. I think that let's would be, do that next week. That we'll do a good. coaching session with me. All right. That sounds excellent. So see you next time. Writers and crafters keep writing and have a great week. Hold that line. Have a great week. Hold it. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye.